Welcome to the Key Chapters of the Bible podcast. This is a daily podcast that's going through the key chapters of God's Word. Today we are looking at 2 Samuel chapter 11 with David's sin with Bathsheba. And so as we go into our passage today, uh, we're now coming to 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're also going to be looking at chapter 12 because it's such a key part of this whole event here. David is now king. You'll remember that he was coronated as king in 2 Samuel chapter 5. He was told of his eternal kingdom in 2 Samuel chapter 7 that he's the first king of this kingdom. Things seem to be going well. In chapter 8, he's got these military victories. In chapter 9, he is faithful to Jonathan, who is now gone, but he's got this son Mephibosheth, and so David's taking care of him. So David seems like he's doing everything right, but then chapter 11 shows us that there's this huge crack in his character. Hopefully you've already read this chapter and hopefully you already know that this is going to be a pretty tough passage to read because we're seeing a man that we admire falling headlong into sin. Now as we go into chapter 11 and chapter 12, the details are fairly straightforward. In verse 1, David is at home when really he should have been going on out for a battle. It says this is when kings go out for that. It doesn't mean that it was fun to go fight. It means that the roads were dry, they had the harvest completed, so they had food and supplies, they could move around easier. And one of the purposes of a king was simply to direct the details and the the battles and keep the people safe. David wasn't doing that. Instead, we see here in this chapter, he's doing his own thing. And so in verse 2, David is on his roof and he looks down and he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. And so the story unfolds and David calls for her and commits adultery with her. Now, Bathsheba was the wife of a righteous soldier named Uriah. David even knew this fact before he called for her to come to him. In verse 3, he asks, who, who is she? And they tell him, not only is she the wife of Uriah the Hittite, but she is also the daughter of Eliam. Now, this is an important detail that we might miss, because Eliam is the son of Ahithophel. We see this over in chapter 23, verse 34. There's a list of genealogies here. And we put everything together. We find on out that Bathsheba is the son of Eliam. She's also the son or the grandson of Ahithophel. And these are the men who conspired against David with Absalom. Remember, there's Absalom's treachery that's coming on up. They join with Absalom. And just the idea is here, or the sense you get is, is that because David sins against Uriah with Bathsheba, the son of Eliam, the grandson of Ahithophel, that they're just going to conspire against him. And Absalom is one way they do that. Well, going back to our passage here, as you know, Bathsheba becomes pregnant. Uh, David freaks out about this, and he tries to bring Uriah back to sleep with her so that no one could figure out what's happened. But Uriah doesn't want to do this. He's a righteous man. He doesn't want to take advantage of something he has that other men don't have, and so he doesn't. And David is then resorting to just basically a form of murder. He has Uriah go back to the front lines, and he and Joab scheme so that Uriah is killed. And in all of this, David is completely ruthless with Uriah because he is so given over to his sin. Well, the chapter ends in verse 27 with David taking Bathsheba for his wife and the verse saying, but the thing that David has done was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now that's the end of chapter 11. Chapter 12 picks up with Nathan the prophet being sent by God about a year later to rebuke David. And he starts out with a parable of a man who has this huge flock of sheep but steals one from a poor man and it was the very lamb that that man loved. Nathan gets David to agree that such an act was evil. David even just condemns this man. And Nathan then responds in verse 7, You are the man. And then proceeds to unload God's judgment upon him. Then in verse 17, we see David's response to all of this. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord. The Lord hears David's repentance and forgives him. But still the child of David and Bathsheba becomes sick and dies. The verses that cover that event of this baby's dying gives us a hidden gem into helping us know if babies go to heaven if they die. We'll come back to that idea in a couple of minutes. Chapter 12 ends with David doing what he should have been doing all along, and he leads God's people to fight against the Ammonites and be delivered from them. So that's the account of chapters 11 and 12. Let's go back to the beginning and let's look at just the flow of sin of this account here because we can see what sin looks like in David's life and how often this is how it looks in our life. And so back in verse 1, David should have been going out for a battle with his men. And right here is this principle of faithfulness. The Lord had exalted David there to be faithful as a leader and do what he's supposed to do. We're also seeing here this principle that faithfulness and obedience to the Lord is interconnected with every other aspect of how we live. When we are unfaithful in one area of our life, we tend to be unfaithful in other areas as well. And so this disobedience here is just compounding in his life. 
Likewise, we're seeing that the disobedience is in the form of idleness. And we often say that idleness is a breeding ground for disobedience. It is often just something that is just where we're being ruled by our flesh. We just don't feel like doing anything. So we're just going to lounge around, just kind of let somebody else take care of things for a while. That's ultimately giving into our flesh. And when our flesh is in control, it will literally never bring us to a righteous place. It may not always bring us to obvious sins like here, but it certainly will not put us in a place or on the path to righteousness. We also see here that in this whole event, the Lord did give David a way out in verse 3. David finds out she's a taken woman. She's married to a a powerful fighter, a a righteous soldier. She is the daughter of a well-known man. He could have simply said, oh, you know what? Uh, Maybe we should just tell her not to take baths and fill his view of everyone else and just go back inside. But David doesn't do that. Instead, he plunges into this whole sin and he ignores this clear door that the Lord had given him as a way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 talks about this door. It says, No temptation has overtaken you, but as such is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. The Lord provided this way of escape for David, but he chose to ignore it. David should have followed the advice that Paul gives to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 22, where he's to flee the youthful lust, flee these things. Instead, David is just really a living example of the warning in James 1.14, where he was drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And because he was unwilling at first even to recognize what he had done, he really just sought to cover it up, and he just got increasingly desperate and increasingly sinful as he tried to cover up what he had done. We can even see this pattern of sin in our own life. And nearly always, it gives us some kind of state of just fleshly living where we're just not pursuing righteousness. Sin always breaks our fellowship with God, but sometimes sin is just a result of broken fellowship with God where we're just really not walking with him and we're just kind of in this abiding state of sin. Maybe not something as extreme as what David is doing ultimately, but we're in that little, just that kind of holding pattern where we're not really pursuing righteousness and we then become an easy target to be tempted and led astray by our sin. And even when these temptations come, we need to know that the Lord has provided ways out. Sometimes it might just be a check in our heart that says, hey, you know what? Don't go there. Sometimes it's the counsel or admonition we receive from somebody who says, you know what, I don't think that's a good way to go. Sometimes the Lord just might help us see that there's nothing good that's going to come from this sin. And so he's giving us these ways out. And if we do sin, and sin's going to come to all of us, the righteous response is simply to repent right away. Think about the pain that could have been avoided if David had just done what is right. Even though he does marry Bathsheba, just think about the judgment that God had brought upon David's life. When you read about what was going to happen to him and how those prophecies came true, David suffered greatly for this sin. And so this is a sad account of a man that we have grown to admire. It's a reminder that no one is immune to the impact of sin, and all of us need to be wise and on guard. It's also a reminder of the awful consequences of sin. Not only has David's family just become just infused with violence, where in verse 10, the sword won't depart from him, and in verse 11, they'll just be evil within his own household and just the things with his own wives. Not only that, but even in verse 14, David's sin had caused the Lord's enemies to blaspheme against him. Just pain. And ultimately, even this leads to the death of David's baby, which we'll come to in a minute as well. And so David could have repented right away and saved just himself so much pain. Chapter 12 gives us a window into what it looks like to repent. And in verse 13, David confesses that he has sinned against the Lord. He obviously knew his actions were wrong. That's why he was scrambling to cover all these things up with these shenanigans with Uriah. Once Dathan rebukes him, though, he comes to this full repentance. If you have time when we're done here, I recommend you go over to Psalm 51 or Psalm 32 and just read about what this repentance looked like. These passages give us window into the kind of repentance that it looks like when we go before God and say, I have sinned and I need your forgiveness and I need to be restored back to fellowship with you. We also see, though, in this passage that repentance and even forgiveness from God does not always remove the consequences of our sins. And we'll be reading about what these consequences look like as we continue just going through 2 Samuel. At times, this could be a tough read. Well, as we wrap up that idea, there's, there's a couple of the points I want to mention from this passage. As I mentioned, this passage provides us a glimmer of hope about the question of what happens to babies if they die. In chapter 12, verses 22 and 23, David is seeking the Lord for the health of his babies because his baby is just sick and dying, and he's fasting and he's seeking the Lord, but then his baby dies and he stops all of that. The people are wondering why, and he gives this window here in verse 23, this window into what happens to the eternal souls of babies when he says, I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, David is an author of scripture, and although he's in this passage clearly not a perfect man, we do know he's going to be with the Lord. 
And so if David is going to be with the Lord one day, and he's going to be with the baby one day, then the baby must be with the Lord. And this principle unfolds in some other passages too. No passage is going to say clearly, these are all by inference. And I think that's just by God's design so that we just learn to trust him in all these things. But in Job chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it mentions infants who die or those who never see the light of day and how they are at rest. Likewise, at the end of the book of Jonah, at the very last verse, the Lord declares his compassion on those who do not know the difference between their right hand and their left hand. That's probably talking about infants. Finally, Jesus tells us that heaven belongs to the little ones in Matthew 19, 14. All of those put together give me hope that the little ones who die are safe in the arms of the Lord. And I also believe that helps us understand why this baby died. You see, the Lord was not punishing the baby, but David. The Lord was bringing this baby into the presence of heaven, into eternal life. In reality, that is a blessing. David himself will never know him in this world. He'll only know him in eternity. We might think that death is the worst that could happen to anyone, but it's not. And so here we have this special judgment upon David where the baby is brought into the presence of glory and David will have to have just the the reality that he'll never know him, at least not until he enters into glory himself. But having said all of this, uh, we shouldn't also think that this is how God normally acts. There are countless babies born every year, every day out of wedlock. This is not God's typical way of handling such things. This passage is a special situation when God is dealing with one of his leaders, the king, and establishing the principles for the kingdom. This passage also gives us a window into God's grace. Because although this marriage was founded upon sin, God used this marriage to produce Solomon. Now he's called Jedediah in chapter 12, verse 25, but that's Solomon. And Solomon is going to be the next king himself. He's a, an aspired author of scripture himself. He himself is not perfect, but he's still a man that God used to establish the glory of the kingdom. And so as we wrap up, these two chapters here teach us of God's holiness, his standards for holiness, his call to repentance, but also his mercy and grace and wisdom when we do repent. Often sin has severe and long-term consequences that we cannot unwind. And yet we see here that God is a God of grace and redemption. And everything we hand to him, everything we bring to him and bring to the cross of Christ, he will redeem. I often view God's grace like a river, that everything we put in that river of grace will just be taken away. It might be taken from us, but it'll be taken to a good and righteous destination. Our responsibility is just bring everything to him and say, Lord, you're a God of grace. I give you this. I confess it was sinful when I did it, but I give it to you. Please bring it to a righteous place now. And he'll take it there. Our responsibility is simply just to bring it all to him and trust him for the outcome. And as we wrap up today, maybe you're thinking about your own life and maybe there's some things that you need to bring to him and put in that river of grace and say, okay, Lord, this was sin. This was sinful. This was rooted in sin. But I just want to confess it and give it to you and ask that you would bring righteousness and goodness out of this. And maybe just spend some time with the Lord bringing these things to him, trusting him for the outcome. We'll leave it there. We'll pick things up tomorrow. Have a great day and God bless.